Hello and uh, welcome to Urban Cycling Institute uh, series on the Crow Manual. So today we are going to talk about Chapter 7 with uh, my guest, uh, Mark uh, Philpotts, who is joining us from the UK. Hi, Mark. Hi. How are How we doing? Good. Um, and today, uh, just to give you a bit of a sense of what we'll talk about, is uh, we'll start with Chapter 7, the Crow Manual, and then we'll hop over to... Uh, uh, Mark's most recent blog post about uh, the lessons that he took away from the Urban uh, Urban Cycling Institute's Unraveling the Cycling City course and some reflections on um, on how cities can, can change uh, in light of that. And then um, we will hop over to uh, some of the slides that uh, Mark has put together for a, uh, a previous conference that he wants to share with you. Um, so let's hop over to uh, Chapter 7 of the, the Crow Manual. And, uh, and I just wanted to read to you a bit, for those listening by audio today, uh, the, the first paragraph, right? And this chapter is about implementing, uh, implementation, maintenance, and furnishings. The chapter starts with saying, infrastructure and other facilities for bicycle traffic are pretty much exclusively determined and designed for by traffic engineers. Boom, that is who makes uh, the implementation of these things happen. I continue, quote, the implementation and maintenance of these designs are undertaken by the operational services of decentralized authorities and its contractors enlisted uh, by these services. So, uh, Mark, you are a traffic engineer by trade, correct? Uh, is, is that an accurate reflection uh, of, of how work gets done in the real world, that traffic engineers implement the design manual? I, th I think that's pretty similar here in the UK. Um, you know, lots of things get done, get built and forgotten about by the traffic and highways guys. And then it's always the poor maintenance team that have to pick up the pieces when it goes wrong. Um, you know, leaves collecting the gut, all, all the usual things that we see. Yeah. Um, so, so that's, uh, you guys are, are really on the front lines, uh, according to this document. And so as someone who's on the front line, I got some, some quite a, quite juicy questions for you, uh, <laughs> because, you know, chapter seven is one of those chapters where, uh, you know, the, it, it's, it's more practical and, and not everyone uh, tack, want, would want to tackle, you know, the street design and intersection design. Those are the most uh, popular ones. Those are the most flashy chapters, chapters three and four. Uh, but chapter seven really gets down to the nitty gritty. Um, so I wanted to start uh, with, uh, let's go to chapter 7.1 uh, here. And it talks about, you know, road surfacing. Right. Uh, and under road servicing and under user requirements, uh, this manual gives four points, right? The, the evenness, uh, the skid resistance and texture, the drainage and the rolling resistance. Um, so, you know, these are very nitty gritty detailed. But as someone who, who rides a bicycle, we know that uh, even something as uh, mundane as skid resistance, right? And the texture of the road. Um, you can really feel it, especially when it's winter. So um, during your, your career, what are some of the um, ways that you've tackled? Let's uh, let's start with winter maintenance. I don't know how much snow you get there, but uh, what are some special considerations that uh, people should consider when, when it comes to winter maintenance and snow? Because that's a popular excuse of people not being able to cycle. I guess from our, our point of view here in London, this year or, or the year just gone we've, we haven't had a winter as such um i don't think the temperatures got below zero very often but um yeah, when we do have snow here um certainly in london in the southeast of england um we don't cope generally um we're not geared yeah. up for it um but other parts of the country lots of rural counties up into scotland you know they get snow every year and they can cope with it um i mean for me as somebody who cycles it takes a lot to stop me cycling. Mm -hmm. um, so even if it's there's snow on the ground, ice on the ground, I'm still out cycling every year. Um, from the winter maintenance point of view, generally there's um, you know gritter lorries going out sorting the streets, you know the, the main roads, bus routes, that kind of thing. So it's perhaps more of a challenge if you're having to get from a residential area out onto some of the main roads, um, especially you know, we have hills here um, in London. I know you guys over in the Netherlands don't, or when you're in the Netherlands, um, <laughs> as such, like like us. Um, and London itself, it's, you know, it's very flat in the centre, but where I live out on the edge, I'm about 50 metres higher than central London. So, 
yeah. know, hills are a consideration in the winter if things aren't been sorted or gritted. Um, so yeah, I think user experience varies across the country with that. Yeah. Um, another piece that I, I found just astounding in the Netherlands is uh, this uh, this idea of evenness. You know, uh, it's it, that is some a piece of detailed design that uh, I have not seen in most other places. So, for example, when you or when you transition from a footway to the pavement, you know, having the curbs uh, completely flush with the ground, yeah. or just the basic maintenance on the the evenness of the the pavement itself. Um, that must come with quite a few technical challenges. So uh, in, your, in your work, what kind of challenges are those? I think the key thing for me is traditionally um, in the UK, we've laid new carriageway surfaces. So um, you know, the, the road surface itself will be laid by machine. Mm -hmm. um, and footways and other surfaces have tended to be laid by hand. And the problem with laying by hand is you don't get great surface regularity. So if you know, you, you're going along the path or the or the cycle track or whatever um, and you're vibrating all the way down you know, even with some really good guys who have built it so for wheeled vehicles because cycles are you know wheeled vehicles we should be machine laying the infrastructure it yeah. makes so much difference i mean if you're going a long distance um you know some some of the paths in london compared to paths in the netherlands it's a different world isn't it <laughs> it is um and i, I want to re read this quote here uh, and the Crow Manual observes uh, under evenness that, quote, with the increase in bicycle speeds, uh, bracket, e-bikes, racing bikes, uh, end bracket, uh, user requirements in terms of evenness are becoming even more demanding. Um, so that, that goes to say that, uh, you know, especially for, for the users who are, who are traveling faster, um, that the technical requirements, at least, is much more like uh, those for automobile traffic. If we think of, you know, the German Autobahn, right? The car's yeah. going at 200 kilometers an hour. Uh, you need to have a very even surface. Um, what, what I kind of wonder here is that, you know, um, in, in a previous live stream, we talked about uh, this paving stones versus asphalt right so with asphalt and you said machine laying you can get a very smooth surface but yeah. i think perhaps the cost the aesthetic cost of that is uh maybe you don't get the uh the environmental design that you would like you know like i know that london especially has uh has their own uh urban design guidelines where like the footway is paved in a certain way and if you use asphalt it, it loses some of that uh, like unique character um, so do you know how uh, that trade-off is, is being made or is it just in general all asphalt these days? Again, experience varies. So London, administratively, you've got 33 boroughs, including the city of London. We have Transport for London, which also has about 5% of the road network. So whilst TfL has its own design standards uh, for its network, each local authority, each borough will have its individual standards as well. So. City of London, for example, tends to be very high quality materials everywhere. Um, go out into the outer boroughs, some of the suburbs, you know, where we've got big sort of highway estates, but not a lot of money. Asphalt tends to rule. So the street I live, we're lucky we've got old fashioned paving slabs, concrete paving slabs, which look very nice. Um, but you certainly wouldn't want to cycle on them. I think the other, the other problem we have as well in London is, and, and I guess the UK, we can't agree on basic standards. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, you go to Manchester or some parts of Greater Manchester, and green surfacing is used cycle tracks. Other parts of the country, it's red. Um, TfL tends to use you know, just ordinary black asphalt. So even that basic level of you know, what colour do we use isn't really sorted out in the UK. Um, the surface, the, you know, the surface itself, whatever colour it is, has to be smooth. That that's absolute key. Yeah. Uh, and, and that, I think, uh, it's not covered in Chapter 7, but in an earlier chapter, we definitely talked about this wayfinding aspect. And I think yeah. the, the surfacing has much to do with that. For example, uh, the London Superhighway Network. I had the pleasure of talking with a, a few practitioners who were working uh, in the, where is it, the, the Traffic Authority? The, 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 the Regional uh, Transport Authority of London. Yeah, so tran transport for London. Ah, TFL. transport for yeah. London. Yeah, and yeah. he talked about the complications of all working through all these boroughs, and especially if you have a long distance cycle network, then it becomes really challenging because you're trying to standardize 
these colors, these wayfinding points uh, that actually move throughout jurisdiction lines. And I've heard the same story from Copenhagen, heard the same story from, you know, places like Brussels, like as soon as you move beyond the regional level, uh, standardization becomes quite important. Um, I, I want to actually take a look at these uh, pictures here um, because uh, th these pictures kind of depict um, the, the different types of paving stones be and the, the different types of asphalt being used here in the Netherlands. And I think uh, in these pictures, there's also a depiction of uh, the various target uses, right? So some of these are clearly for uh, recreational uses, uh, for example, the top right, um, where, uh, you know, the, the paving it that in a way that blends into nature is more important than, uh, for example, in the uh, top left or the bottom right, where it's, it's clearly completely for a functional use. Um, so, so there are many approaches to this seemingly simple um, problem of paving. And, uh, and, and that's something to be aware of, I think, uh, for, for our audience, that there is more than just asphalt, that there's options out there. Uh, and sometimes it's more than just the uh, traffic engineering, the smoothness criteria. It's also the criteria that was covered, you know, back in the, the previous chapters where, you know, wayfinding and, and design are important. Uh, I want to move ahead to uh, chapter, uh, sorry, ch chapter seven point, section seven point uh, two, actually. Uh, seven point two. It's it's a it's a few places ahead. Ooh, you know what? Before we get there, uh, let's let's get into the idea of costs. This is uh, page number one seventy seven. Uh, uh, under section I, so A, B, C, D, F, G, H, I. Um, and it, it, this is where I think when I talk with practitioners, there's, there's a lot of uh, discussion over, you know, for example, the, the fact that red asphalt costs in, in, in most countries like a few times more than just normal asphalt. And I'll, I'll read a, a little section from here uh, under costs. And it says, Cost comparisons awfully unjustly consider investment costs only. An accurate cost comparison is only possible if all life cycle costs are taken into consideration. Hence, the costs of minor and major maintenance work, annual management, including winter maintenance, which we just talked about, and weeding, and the residual value or demolition costs at the end of the planned life cycle will also need to be included. Uh, I think it's interesting that uh, this section also talks about the demolition costs uh, because we, we tend to forget that infrastructure is actually quite alive and gets uh, updated uh, quite frequently. Um, so I don't know if you, you've worked with you know ripping up old asphalt, but do you know uh, whether that's, uh, that's a major consideration, uh, perhaps at the very end of the cycle of what kind of materials are easier to dispose of? What kind of materials are, are more recyclable uh, in, in that regards? I mean, certainly with asphalt, when that's being replaced, um, you know, planed out and taken away, a hell of a lot of the material is recycled into new asphalt. Um, yeah. We've got some very high recycling rates for that in, in the UK industry. And I assume that's the same in lots of places. Um, you know, lots of people describe the road network as a linear quarry almost. So, you know, if you can recover the materials, you're reducing the capital cost of what's going back um, if it's a big scheme. And that doesn't matter so much if it's, you know, whatever color the asphalt is, it's the fact that it's got the right stone content and it's usable. Um, we don't use it so much in the UK, but you know, block paving is used all over the Netherlands. You can pick it up, relay it, you can have utility go through it, that could be relayed. And if it's really failed, that can go through a crushing plant and be reused. Mm -hmm you know, as secondary aggregates as well. So I don't think people worry so much about it because it's kind of implicit that, you know, yeah. there is a life to the surfacing, it'll, you know, and the curves, whatever, it'll be replaced. Um, but probably, um, I would say cycling infrastructure would outlast lots of people if it's done at the first, <laughs> at the first time. You know, yeah, roads yeah. and tails get resurfaced. Every, you know, a main road will be every seven to ten years. Especially so. the ones with the big lorries on them. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. So, But yeah, that, that material has a value there. Yeah. Um, for recycling, absolutely. 
it's very cool that's something you know, as as sustainability becomes more of a theme right uh than this whole life cycle investment in terms of uh uh, recycling materials also comes into play so that's that's very cool we have sustainable transportation and then we have sustainable infrastructure ideally that can also support that transportation yeah um i want to jump ahead to 7.1.5 uh, we talked a bit earlier in the introduction about the transitions between uh, the surface and the the verge right and uh, here in the manual actually it says that um it could actually be a safety issue so uh in the second paragraph of 7.1.5, you will see it says, I quote, in particular, the the difference in height between the cycle path and the verge is important when it comes to preventing single vehicle bicycle accidents. A verge can be worn down by tires, for example, creating an elongated pothole uh, right next to the cycle path. Another option is to have the asphalt on the cycle path a little higher than the verge. The edge of the surfacing can begin to crumble and crack due to subsidence on part of the verge, for example. It is important that the edge of the sur surface is beveled off. Concrete, in particular, can sometimes have sharp edges. Even with minor differences in height, these make it tricky to get back off the verge and onto the surfacing. Um, and it's interesting to see safety in this regard mentioned, right? Because we usually think of uh, I guess places with less cyclists, uh, safety in relation to motorized vehicles and, and crashes. But here, uh, this manner actually extensively treats um, single vehicle uh, accidents as well. So because of the number of elderly people cycling here in the Netherlands. Uh, do, do you have any comments about how uh, the design of infrastructure in, in the UK kind of also tries to mitigate these issues or is it not really a big issue at the moment? <sighs> I don't. I don't think we have enough people cycling in those situations. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, perhaps we're talking more rural places than, than urban here. So, urban tends to be curves everywhere, um, yeah. which come with their own risks and uh, and issues. Um, certainly, where you've got surfaces paved, which end at the verge, so there's no curb restraint or anything, you do get this crumbling, weeds coming in, you know, grass mm -hmm. growing, things starting to break up. So, some good practice would be to extend the the lower pavement layers out beyond where the surfacing would be um, to make sure the, you know, the the support continues all the way out. Um, I guess the other problem you have in those situations is they're often used um, you know, by maintenance vehicles, cutting hedgerows back, um, even sort of people breaking down, bouncing up on you know, from the roads to yeah. the broken down vehicles. So, you know, loading at the edges there can be an issue where it's not cycle traffic. You know, it's other people doing other things. Um, I don't really think it comes up a huge amount in the UK, but certainly, you know, if you don't deal with edges properly, they'll just collapse and fall away, for sure. Yeah, so the lifetime of a bicycle infrastructure uh, could have more to do with the slight erosion than any catastrophic damage, right, as the, yeah, the case so with lorries. It could be erosion, it could be an issue yeah. with how things were constructed in the first place. It's not the traffic causing the problem. Yeah. You know, cycles don't impart load. Really. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Not in that uh, way. And something it's like the the road damage is like to the to the cube or fourth power of, of yeah, load or something. Or, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's so. So if you have a very, that's why it's so important to to keep uh, these trucks under the weight limit. But we have no such issues with with cycling at all because it's such a light vehicle. I want to move on to uh, material uh, for markings, um, and I think uh, we talked about pavement surfaces. This is seven point one point eight. Uh, we talked about pavement surfaces uh, and and the coloring of pavements. I want to get your take on uh, markings, right? I will read a, a section here from 7.1.8. Uh, markings, I quote, are intended to guide road users and to clarify traffic situations. It is for that reason, it is essential for markings to be properly situated, recognizable and visible. This particularly applies to markings for cycling facility they must make clear where other road users could expect cyclists to be. In addition, there are markings that primarily have a function for the cyclists themselves. Edge lines, this is, this is something interesting they're experimenting with the Netherlands, is, is the edge lines, um, to delineate the road alignment and the central markings on bi-directional cycle paths to make it clear that uh, oncoming traffic can be expected. And uh, one piece uh, 
of research has shown that uh, going back to this single vehicle crashes idea that elderly people actually have uh, quite a difficult time uh, in low light in recognizing where the edge of uh, the cycle path is so they've started to put in these edge markings that we just saw in this uh, photo in the design manual um, d as for the center line uh, I was I was wondering what is uh, kind of trending here uh, there in in London what kind of markings are you using is it like white markings paint or are you foregoing markings altogether uh, I think, as usual in these things, opinion is divided. Um, yeah. Lots of the um, sort of decent cycle superhighway schemes in central London, um, bi-directional, but generally they're not marked with a centre line. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the idea there is it's to try and um, capture the fact they're often tidal. Um, centre lines will come in at key uh, safety critical points. Um, my own view is if it's a bi-directional track, it should have a center line because it reminds people that it's bi-directional. And if somebody's trying to overtake a slower cyclist, then they realize they have to again, you know, over here, pull over back to the left um, because you've got oncoming cyclists. I think yeah, it's a bit of an issue sometimes with the urban design people who want to try and minimize you know, road markings, clutter, that kind of thing. But yeah, you know, I, I think you know, it's, it's more of a think rather than having any data to back it up in the UK. I think it's good practice to have the centre line. Certainly, my experience of cycling in the Netherlands on bi-directional tracks were that having centre lines were helpful. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that you mentioned for urban designers, it's it's a matter of aesthetics uh, and clutter, uh, whereas for for the engineers that. Uh, that the center line is, is a matter of you know utility and function. And that's something I, I've been it, doing research on and exploring how we frame the different uh, language that we use to describe, right? Uh, the, the various uh, traffic devices that we use. Uh, so for example, a stop sign could be uh, vital to the safety of, uh, of an intersection, but at the same time, you know, having too many signs uh, could be this idea of clutter. Uh, interestingly, uh, that in the next section, the Crow Manual, where it mentions plants and and uh, and verges, uh, it also mentions the the trade-off between uh, having uh, the lots of greenery, but also having the disadvantages listed, being that greenery sometimes gets in the way, it requires maintenance, and you don't get as good uh, sight lines with greenery. Um, how is the how do you feel actually because you've been about London with how uh, greenery is being implemented I guess it's like within the city in general but more specifically next to, to cycleways I mean, it doesn't strike me that there's any sort of grand plan for it you know if, mm. if there's a street being retrofitted um, it's nice to get greenery and it's nice to get trees and so that often happens um, we should, you know, should certainly do more of it. So there's a good example in Stratford in East London, which has had a big gyratory unbundled. Um, the greenery has been incorporated with sustainable drainage systems. So that's a really good way of incorporating you know, a good drainage system and the greenery. Um, and of course, if you're designing something carefully, then you can mitigate for tree roots and you know, other maintenance issues. Although I think we do struggle sometimes with the fact that leaves fall every autumn. Um, you know, we, we don't tend to clear them up quickly enough in, in many places so you know let's have greenery where we can as much as possible yeah. you know, it's, it's good for an attractive experience isn't it <laughs> it sure. is ideally but also maintenance right uh, i want to jump ahead to uh, lighting actually so uh lighting it talks about lighting in tunnels it talks about lighting uh on on road sections and it talks about how uh lighting interacts with uh, these markings to, to help guide people uh, as they progress on the path. Um, so uh, I pulled up a picture here of the, it's a Rhein pad between Arnhem and Nijmegen in the Netherlands where they've actually used lighting as a branding tool, uh, much like wayfinding and signs. So subtly that, uh, that they've used uh, this, in this picture, like the three, a two chain link with some colors in their, their lighting to also indicate to people you know, if they notice it, that it's it's also part of the the bicycle highway in that section. Um, do you in in the London context? Um, do you see the lighting for bicycle infrastructure as being more similar to the lighting used for you know pedestrian walkways, 
or uh, do you usually just um, make do with uh, these high mast uh, street lighting? Uh, is there any attention paid to like the unique pedestrian scale of bicycle infrastructure? Again, it varies with location, but you know, with the cycle superhighway type treatments along big roads, mm. then you have a general road lighting system which you know, illuminates everything. Um, you know, the, the, the photo in, in, the, in the manual there, you know, we will do similar in that situation if it's away from um, a main road. Um, and, you know, actually the, the design standards for lighting would apply in the same way as it would for most traffic to cycle traffic because you're after a certain level of luminance, you're highlighting um, you know, risk points or interaction points. Um, there might be task lighting at crossings of, of big roads. Um, so I, I don't think we have anything special, particularly in the UK or, or London. Um, mm -hmm. it's, again, it's about the function of the light. I mean, certainly things like uh, white light LED is really helpful um, for color definition. You, you, you know, it's better to pick out other people coming towards you. Um, yeah, whether we go to the expense of, of having nice, um, you know, interesting or clever lighting at the top, sometimes we do on, on big schemes, but generally it's quite utilitarian. Okay, uh, let's uh, let's flip over to the signage. Actually, let's do seven point four and then seven point five, and then wrap this up. Uh, the signage. Uh, there's a couple of photos here actually about mm. uh, what signage looks like in the Netherlands. Um, and uh, and I, I know that because from my conversation with uh, the bicycle planners uh, working at Transport for London in the UK that uh, the London also invests in quite a bit of effort into pedestrian as well as cycling signage, uh, especially related to the uh, cycle, cycle superhighway system. Uh, are, are you guys taking like inspiration for the Dutch example? And also a question is uh, how does this signage get designed? You know, like who comes up with it and are there standards uh, and what kind of considerations uh, do you guys put in for the design of, of good wayfinding, good signage? So the, in general, we've got some fairly um, prescribed standards for signs, lines, um, traffic signals, all these kind of things anyway in the UK. So we have a big book of regulations which you know, does apply across the country. Mm -hmm. Um, so we can't make things up as we go along. And, and, and for, for wayfinding, that's really helpful because we have to be consistent. Yeah. Um, what we don't have is the Dutch system using nodes, which... You know, oh, that's interesting, actually, that, yeah, that so, whole system, so right? Yeah. We, we, we tend to have a destination system mm -hmm. um, which has its roots you know, from, from decades ago in managing motor traffic. So I'm going from you know, A to B. I'll be following the destination signage all the way along. Um, and that can be an issue if there's a missing sign or something. You can get lost mm -hmm. quite easily. Um, the cycle superhighway is, is quite interesting because they've got um, almost like a tube map by the side of the yeah. road every so often. So um, you're going from you know outer London into central London. You'll be going past different um, localities. You'll have a time to the next one, time to the, um, the centre. So time-based... Um, signage is quite helpful to try and promote it a bit i suppose so if you're driving or you're stuck in a traffic jam and you see the cycle sign actually it's only 10 minutes to cycle i might get out or, you know out of the car onto the bike um i think we've had a big issue in the uk of being very route centric anyway rather than network centric and that probably translates into the signs that we have at the moment um, but unless it's you know something special like the cycle super highways it's a very straightforward standard you know, it's blue signs with white text, you know, fairly straightforward, fairly cheap to implement. Um, probably not used properly enough in many cases. Um, yeah, it's fear of getting lost is, next, mm. is an issue. Well, let's uh, go ahead to uh, 7.5, uh, personal safety. Now, um, I, I know in most places around the world, the, the predominant issue is uh, that of traffic safety, right? And And... I'm afraid that what gets missed in that conversation is by focusing on the motor vehicle, this idea of, of social safety gets, gets missed. Um, right? Like for example, if we talk about lighting, if we talk about, um, road marking, if we talk about signage, it's all about, uh, 
making sure that people are protected from you know, collisions, right? The purpose of lighting is uh, to make sure other car drivers see you and that you can see cars coming. The purpose of signage is to help people uh, understand and safely cross an intersection. Uh, but this idea of personal safety then puts extra emphasis on, okay, so once we've established these basic, uh, I guess, traffic safety features, we can start thinking uh, a bit more about uh, what it means for, for example, a, a woman uh, cycling alone at night, uh, special needs of uh, people with disabilities, um, and, and that gets us into a whole you know, other discussion about, uh, about what cycling infrastructure is and, and who is it for. Uh, would, I know you, you're very opinionated on on aspects related to this, uh, so so perhaps you can give us a, a rant about uh, the importance of uh, you know personal safety and taking it into consideration of the needs of the user perspective. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess it's an odd odd thing to have in this chapter of of Crow anyway, because yeah. it's almost a bolt on here, isn't it? it um, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, but um, I, I think again with with the UK context to it, there's there's been a um, you know, bike clashes we've had all over the world where we're trying to put cycle routes along main roads because that's where the shops are, the schools and all these kind of things. Um, but instead, we route everybody down back streets and canal paths um, and greenways, things like this. So, you know, what might be fine during the middle of the day for everybody, a relatively quiet route. But as soon as the sun sets and it's dark, even with street lighting, there's fewer people around. It feels less safe for sure. Um, you know, there are sporadic cases of you know, muggers ambushing people as well on these quiet routes. So I think for personal safety, um, you know, that, that's almost something that should be built into how you develop your network from the start. You know, people will revert to type almost and think, well, it's less comfortable, it's less safe on the main road, but actually I feel a lot safer from a personal point of view. Um, I'm going to stick to the main road. The back yeah. street might be, you know, might feel nicer away from traffic, but that's balanced against the thing being dark, you know, very few people around and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, we, we've got to tackle everything really. You know, we've got to build the networks, not so much the routes, I think. And, and, and personal safety comes big into that, I would say. Yeah, and it's a, it's a nice and inclusive way to, to think about um, uh, how, how the approach that we use to designing cycling infrastructure. Uh, and, and finally, uh, 7.5 is just a brief bit about uh, other facilities. Uh, it talks about here uh, rest areas, uh, shelters, um, and uh, whoa, bottle banks. Uh, bottle banks are sited at least five meters from the edge of the surfacing to avoid collisions with the obstacle. I'm not quite sure what that means. Do you know what that means? <laughs> bottle banks. I th I'm guessing that's, um, I, I guess, from the Dutch experience because everybody does everything by bike. Um, you, you'll take your bottles to the bottle bank, and there's always somebody that drops a bottle. So ah, for the glass. That, that okay, that kind of makes the, sense. Yeah, yeah, lots, yeah, lots yeah. of drunk, well, hungover. <laughs> probably drop off, I guess. Right. Um, you know, and, other and you would, you could puncture your tire. Uh, yeah. If, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I see. Yeah. But yeah, there there are yeah you know, other things. Um, yeah, you know, I'm not so convinced about shelters, perhaps, but <laughs> you know, decent places to park cycles. You know, secure, overlooked. Thanks, Mark. And I think that was a very informative coverage of Chapter 7 of the Crow Manual. It's quite a lot in there, a lot of details. And uh, it's very good to hear from a practitioner who, who knows the details of the tra trade. Um, so we'll hop over now to a presentation that was delivered by uh, Mark Vilpots uh, to the Future Build uh, session um, on uh, the critical infrastructure stage. And he did this presentation on behalf of Scraco. Um, I thought it would be interesting for uh, him to, to walk you through this presentation. It touches on a lot of overlapping themes with uh, the themes that we discussed in Chapter 7. Uh, so stay tuned. And then at the very end of the presentation, we'll then hop over and have a brief chat about his blog post. So uh, take it away, Mark. Okay, thanks, George. So this was a presentation that I put together um, as part of the day job with uh, Sweco. Um, at the Future Build conference, and it was just yeah, it's a really quick overview of sort of impacts on uh, design with maintenance materials and street works, as it says. Um, you know, we're doing a lot of retrofitting work, reimagining streets, rebuilding streets. So I thought it'd be good to share this with you guys. So um, well, that's me. You've, you've been introduced, so I'll just blast through there. Um, that's that's us during the day. 
uh, one of the biggest firms you've never heard of, but we've got experience across the whole of um, Northern Europe, including the Netherlands. So you know, quite a good heritage there. So in terms of actually um, you know, building infrastructure for, for maintenance and, and management, we've heard the five principles, coherence, directness, attractiveness, safety, and comfort. Um, I think most people listening to this have probably heard of those and they overlap a lot, they contradict sometimes. And so how do those requirements get framed in material choices and how do we maintain our asset? Um, how do they impact on the way we deal with utility works and you know, other works such as developments or building works, that kind of thing. So taking each of those five um, in turn, um, I've used coherence here, which is sort of the UK interpretation, but it's the same thing. Um, so a coherent piece of infrastructure looks at walking and cycling on the network level. We recognize that people have destinations on main roads that we can't accommodate everything with back streets, which is a bit of a UK issue. Um, sometimes we have to invest to deal with um, significant barriers and things have to be legible, joined up. You know, so you go between maintenance boundaries and, and it's consistent. Um, and that can include going into private areas and all these kind of things. So everything needs to be seen. That's, that's what we're aiming at. Um, and the photograph shown that is in London, it's in Walden Forest, so we can do red surfacing, which is fantastic. So some implications will be that, you know, users can understand what's expected of them. Um, and that's helped by consistency of materials and detailing. That what we build is durable, it's well detailed, um, it's easy to maintain and so cyclical maintenance is going through doing sweeping doing the weed um, clearance major maintenance is where we go in and resurface and do you know major repairs so yeah we, we're trying to design to make that easy um, a key walking and cycling route could be taken out of use by works um, and that will impact the coherence and we need to be very careful with bespoke materials and detailing which can be harder to maintain and for utility companies to reinstate afterwards so with directness, this can be more localized. We're accommodating people's desire lines. We should be giving people the you know, direct route, which can be between destinations or through individual junctions. And directness can be thought of uh, as time and distance. So, you know, people may go slightly longer route if it's quicker, but that can add to you know, physical effort for the trip. Uh, photo there is just maintaining some directness um, on, on this particular cycle track for building works. So, yeah, so directness is maintained through work sites. We want materials that can be reinstated quickly so we can get things back in service. Um, and it's where we put utility chambers. So, you know, if a utility has to stop, open up the chamber to do some maintenance work, does that really impact on how people can move through the, the space? And if we're planning work, unlike that photo there, we're looking after people. Um, you know, this particular example, I think, had something like a 500 metre diversion, um, which is yeah, pretty poor. Attractiveness, we, we did talk a little bit earlier about getting landscaping in. So, yeah, nice example there from Stratford in East London, which is a drainage area and landscaped. Um, get some greenery into the street. So we don't have to use expensive materials to look good. It doesn't have to be, always be the case. And materials are not there to compete with the street. If we've got some great architecture, that's what we're concentrating on. Good detailing to avoid um, failure, rubbish, traps, you know, potholes, ponding of water, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, and keeping clutter to a minimum. Only put stuff into the street that has a use. Um, and if it's got more than one use, even better. Um, and difficult to maintain materials with awkward detailing means it will degrade and therefore the attractiveness is reduced. Certainly in the UK, and I guess everywhere, it's got tight maintenance budgets. So if things are difficult to maintain or expensive to maintain, um, you know, that's the first thing that gets cut. And poor maintained streets will lose a sense of place and people won't want to use it. So it's, you know, it doesn't feel quite as nice. With safety, we, we covered the whole thing about um, you know, people falling off the cycle with the verges a, a little while ago. So you know, it's not just about people being safe from traffic, it's about the infrastructure not failing in a way that makes um, people fall off the cycle. We recognise that people do make mistakes and that people want protection. 
Um, and safety is objective. It's, you know, it can be casualty data, but it's also about the things that people feel the subjective safety. And for sort of maintenance materials, we use forgiving curbs. So you can see in the diagram there or the photo there, we do have a forgiving curb used in the UK, which is quite good. Um, we want to prevent damage to cycling surfaces and walking surfaces by lorries and, and people parking and poor maintenance uh, reinstatements. We're managing tree roots and we're using appropriate species for the situation in the space. We want good grip and you know, appropriate lighting for the situation. And comfort, um, we talked about having you know, good surface regularity so people aren't being vibrated as they cycle along. So you know, that's where you get machine laid surfaces. Um, we want to feel protected from traffic. And unless we've got a very low walking and cycling flow, as we have in this particular photo, we, we, we are, we're about separating walking and cycling modes. Um, you know, gentle ramps, limiting times that people need to stop. This is the flow we were talking about earlier. Um, and some, you know, decent legibility and wayfinding. Um, yeah, an example of not what to do here. Um, that's, that's a route into a park, so quite a significant trip. So good attention to ironwork, smooth surfaces, flush curbs at pedestrian crossings, asphalt to asphalt transition. So if you're going between a cycle track and a carriageway, that's what we need. Uh, and signage that's well maintained and robust. And, and lastly, there, good surface water management. Um, so all the photos so far have been of the UK, but here's one of uh, Utrecht, um, just to demonstrate some well laid, machine laid red asphalt there, um, which is the right color if you ask me. Uh, but asphalt is easy for maintenance, it's easy for utility repairs, it's great for transitions between carriageways uh, and the cycle tracks, so you've got a tie in just there. Um, and you know, red or a color is good for distinguishing cycle tracks from other surfaces. Um, you know, we can patch it up and keep it going for a while, we use black for, for pothole repairs, and eventually we'll resurface anyway. So, you know, the argument about not using color kind of falls away there. Uh, modular paving is great. Um, it's good for footways, easy to, you know, to reinstate, perhaps less attractive for cycle tracks. Um, and the thing that tends to destroy our surfaces, HUVs, buses, you know, great photo of a failure there that's taken ages to repair. And temporary repairs can affect the comfort of people walking and cycling. So if we're designing from scratch, we need to consider putting utilities into easy to get to places, um, places that are not going to be taking infrastructure out of surface, uh, service. Uh, lighting can be accessed easily. So folding columns are quite good for cycle tracks and footways. Uh, and that's me. So that's the day job there with a link to my LinkedIn account and an email address. So that's it, a quick whistle stop tour. Wow, thank you very much, Mark, uh, for the presentation. Now I want to uh, hop over to a blog post that you recently wrote on uh, your blog, The, the Ranty Highwayman. Um, and uh, this was written on, on the 5th of April, uh, called, titled Go With The Flow. And uh, in, in this blog post, you, you talk about, you know, we're in some coronavirus times and, and how, uh, how you've been reading up on the, the latest in, uh, in how uh, new ideas from bicycle infrastructure and, and, and cycling in cities. So do, do you want to share with us uh, a bit about your, your personal I guess, journey in learning about some new things about cycling in the past few weeks? Well, I guess I mean the, the blog has been something going for a while, and it's a way of crystallising, you know, stuff I've read, stuff I've learnt. Um, yeah, I, I learn through doing, so actually doing some writing has been quite good for me. Um, and I think with the whole coronavirus thing, you know, it's thrown everybody. Work has shoved everybody out into their homes. Um, you know, we're all adapting very, very quickly. So it took me two or three weeks to get back into writing properly and go with the flow. Was you know as you said it's been inspired by a few things that happened last week so we've had various talks come out um we've had digital world bike which was which was great um and it got me thinking so this whole idea of flow um mm -hmm. i don't know it it's when you're in the zone perhaps you know so you, you're not thinking about cycling it's all very pleasant and the photo i used was actually next to a um out london trunk road which takes forty-six thousand vehicles a day um, 
and cycling along that path, which is, you know, it's not a fantastically wide or well-maintained path, um, but I'm going along this big old trunk road. I can hear the birds singing. I can look around, see the greenery. So I've got an upright bike. So, you know, it's probably the closest I've been to cycling in rural Netherlands for a while. Huh, huh. Um, you know, going through this area, you, you can see there's houses on both sides, but there are rural sections. And I think, yeah, just I'm in the zone there. I'm doing a, a utility trip. And it's the kind of thing that we want people to feel every time they do cycle, whether it's urban or rural. Um, and it's just a way of, you know, crystallizing those thoughts into a blog post. Yeah. And uh, and you're, you're active on the blog. You're active on uh, Twitter as well. Uh, is there anywhere else that, that we can find you on, on the Internet sphere? Um, I'm on LinkedIn uh, sporadically, but generally uh -huh. the blog and Twitter is where I spend most of my time and probably too much time, uh, like anybody. Um, but yeah, it's just, just a way of exploring ideas. And, and certainly social media has been fantastic over the last few weeks, keeping in touch with people that I know. Um, you can take stuff offline and have a conversation as well. So yeah, just keep the ideas circulating, really. Yeah, uh, and they people can find you at uh, at the the Ranty Highwaymen uh, on Twitter. I'll put a I'll put a link uh, in the YouTube description below, uh, and also uh, Mark's available on LinkedIn. So if you want to get in touch with him, you know that's what he does. Uh, plus, uh, he has a blog post, uh, a, a blog um, that he maintains called uh, the Ranty Highwaymen dot com, which I'll also link to uh, in the description below so uh, mark thank you very much for this conversation and it's really good to have you on today now thank you george all right take care